delighted to see you all. Welcome. Um, this program has been facilitated by Casey Morrison, member of the Westminster, well, actually, official and official member of the Westminster Peace and Justice Work Group. Um, very, very glad um, that he has arranged with Professor Richardson to be here. And, and this coincides with the work we're doing collaboratively with the, uh, the Earth Care Task Force at Westminster. So this is kind of a, a multifunctional program this evening. Um, and I will turn it over to Casey who will do the introductions and get us started. Thank you, Sue. I'm uh, delighted to have my colleague, Jeffrey Richardson here um, this evening from the University of Delaware. Um, he will be new to some of you, but he is um, known to some members of, of this group because of his various activities um, around the, the state of Delaware. Jeffrey is currently a professor in um, the African-American studies, um, Africana studies department at the University of Delaware. Um, and he also serves as the director of diversity outreach and community engagement in the College of Arts and Sciences where the Africana studies department is, is located. Um, he's got many, many years of e experience in working on the environment and organizational management, labor uh, organization. Uh, he has worn many hats um, in his uh, career. Um, and um, he is currently uh, running uh, a solar company in this, this, this community, uh, a technology that he developed in the West Coast and in, in, in California, the Imani Energy in, Incorporated, which is providing um, solar power systems um, in this community. He was for a long time uh, on the West Coast, served as a labor organizer out there. He was involved in the um, office of Karen Bass, who you may remember was one of Mr. Biden's potential candidates for vice president. He, he worked in, in her office when she was a member of the California um, Assembly. Um, I could tell you lots of things about Jeffrey, but he's gonna do the talking uh, this evening. So I'm delighted to present him to you, Jeffrey. Um, Casey, thank you very much for that great introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it and appreciate the opportunity to spend some time to talk about uh, the issue of environmental justice. And, uh, and I guess the title essentially is dealing with environmental justice in an affluent society like the United States. And um, so there's so much going on related to the environment. Um, it's related to the environment, but it's also related to the history of the country and really the history of the world. And what I'll do is I'll work through a PowerPoint uh, and I'll try to share the screen and then I'll um, come back where you maybe have some discussion about the points in the PowerPoint, if you will. So hopefully maybe about 25 minutes or so on the presentation and then we can come back and just talk about was there. I think we have a, a group that we can get into discussion. I'm looking forward to learning from all of you. I see we got some wisdom in the room here, so this should be great. Um, so without any further ado, let me pull up the slide presentation. And if you have a, a pressing question, just you can ask me then, but I, if we can get through it, then that would be great. <clears throat> so I thank you for this opportunity. So we're dealing with the challenges to environmental justice in the affluent society. And I thank you again, the Peace and Justice Work Group for this opportunity to spend some time with you this evening. So essentially what we're gonna cover is, you know, basically what is environmental justice? And that may seem like, well, do we really need to do this? But there's so much discussion about environmental justice now and it's become much more topical and more prevalent but there actually is a movement with the history, which I can't go through all of that, but just a couple of snippets from the history of the environmental justice movement. It actually is a movement. It does have a history. Um, it has key players to help to develop the 
this movement. So I want to spend some time dealing with that, talk about some of those barriers um, in an affluent society like the United States, and maybe some just a couple of thoughts about action, things that people can do, and then some discussion. So that's kind of like the roadmap for the uh, for the presentation. <clears throat> So with this group, I'm sure you know this, so I'll go through some of these things fast, but we obviously are in a petrochemical economy. Um, this COP26, which is going on right now over in Glasgow, I think you've probably seen reports on that in the news and this major international conference dealing with hopefully reaching some type of progress on climate change and getting the major industrial nations in particular to make some commitment to reduce fossil fuel emissions. But it is this area which is one of the key causes of climate change and the crisis that we face in the environment and that humanity faces as a result of this. And these pictures demonstrate one, the extraction of resources, which has a long history and it's absolutely connected to the crisis that we face as a globe, but also in the environmental justice context, which I'll go through in a moment. You see one picture on the right with the oil wells pumping oil. Um, usually that's processed in some type of facility and carried on trains. And we have the Delaware City Refinery, which is not that far from the University of Delaware campus. And it's a major facility in, in the country. And you see trains like this going through. I live in Wilmington. I see the trains coming through um, with this fossil fuel um, being carried. So this is part of the, the economy in a very significant way, petrochemical economy with huge implications for the environment and health of the population. So some of the impacts on this are, well, we're seeing the upper right or upper left, rather, you see the a picture from someone in Detroit so several years ago about water, people not being able to pay for their water and people's water being cut off and people saying, hey, this is a right, we need water to live. Um, in the middle, at the top, you see what is called a fence line community where you have youth playing and living really close to a, a facility. You see smoke coming out of there with could be all types of chemicals, et cetera, impacting health. Part of the consequences of climate change are flooding, fires as we saw in California on the lower left-hand corner. And then we have troops patrolling an area where oil is being drilled. And this brings in the issue of militarization of our economy connected to oil, which is also connected to degradation of the environment. And then we see a picture here in the lower right of Africa. And one of the distinguishing uh, elements of this picture is that you see Africa is darker and in, in, in the north, you see a lot of these little dots. Those are the lights from cities. And it just demonstrates the imbalance in resources where you have this huge continent um, with 1.3, 1.4 billion people, but not having access to electricity for many of the people on the continent. And we can kind of, get into some of the reasons for that and how it relates to issues of environmental justice. So we have one planet, one planet, nowhere else to go. And we may be talking about going to Mars. And I've heard this in other presentations, but the reality is if we don't change, my thinking is I don't think going to Mars is gonna be the solution because it also gets us into this system that we can just pretty much trash one planet and then just go to another planet not a really good way to live or view life and the connectedness of life. So in the environmental justice context, we look at the environment, it is more than just the water or the natural environment, it is all of those, but it is also where we live, where we work, where we play, where we worship, where we go to school, as well as the physical and natural world. So a more expansive definition of what the environment is so that those children you saw in a picture in the last uh, slide, playing outside near a facility, which is spewing out various toxins that they're breathing in because they live in the fence line community, that is part of the environment as well. And so we want to raise up their concerns at the same level we raise up the, the fish, the water, the air, the fowl, all of those need to be raised up for humanity as well. So a couple of definitions about environmental justice. It's the fear treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, 
implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And fair treatment really means that, that no group of people, including racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic groups, should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences that result from industrial, municipal, and commercial operations, or the execution of federal, state, local, and travel programs and policies. So basically what we're saying is that environmental justice means everyone, and everyone is entitled to equal protection and equal enforcement. So at least a bit of a definition for environmental justice. Really. So the environmental justice movement isn't seeking simply to redistribute environmental harms, but to abolish them. So this is a different perspective. So instead of saying, well, one group is getting they have all these facilities there and they're getting another facility. They've been there for years and they're getting high rates of cancer, emphysema, et cetera. Well, let's just spread these out. The environmental justice movement is really saying no one should be harmed. So this requires a different way of doing things. And the next paragraph speaks to that, that we begin to transition away from the models and values that represent basically a near worship of economic growth and quote unquote free market over human life and the sustainability of life as an extension of a healed and cared for environment. All right, so it's a transitioning of our economy, it's a transitioning of how we do things and a transitioning of, to a different type of value system as well. So this is rooted in history and there's a environmental justice activist, one of the early pioneers of this movement in the history of black women from the South, Beverly Wright. She writes in a book called The Quest for Environmental Justice. This is just a, to put this in a context. A history of slavery spawned environmental racism in the United States. Environmental racism is also a byproduct of the racial segregation and discrimination legitimated in the South by Jim Crow laws enacted between 1877 and 1954 and the U.S. Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education struck down separate but equal laws that made all forms of segregation and discrimination legal, customs and practices, and other areas of the United States as well permitted the segregation. You all know that. This is obvious. The, the disenfranchisement of an entire race of people was the law in the southern states, and this is a key point here, but it was practiced throughout the country, and its forms included discrimination in housing, education, public transportation, as well as the availability of recreational facilities and restaurant service. Environmental racism, she states, is merely one vestige of the overall pattern and practice of racism in the United States. I think that's a, an important factor. It's racism in the environmental context. We could do another presentation on racism in the legal system, racism in the educational system, racism in the scientific communities, racism in the health community. We could, racism in housing, in the housing sector. So this is really focusing on racism within the environmental context, but it's connected to a larger issue. And one of the things that's mentioned here, discrimination in housing, with redlining, which has segregated communities and did segregate communities, denying access to loans, et cetera, it has created the spatial segregation that then is reinforced with the segregation of the actual pollutant and the waste of our society, which is cited in low income and people of color communities. So the issue of race, which precedes environmental racism, if you will, is a crucial factor. So to talk about two examples here, racism and environmental and human health. So when we look at the beginning of this country, speaking of the indigenous people, we had the beginnings of the incursions and impacting of the environment from way back, even before there was something that we call environmental justice, with genocidal practices against indigenous peoples to take their land, to extract mineral wealth, fishing, timber, uh, attacks on culture, attacks on the sovereignty, uh, forcing indigenous people to reservations, which led to impoverishment, uh, devastating environmental and health consequences resulted from this. 
So the environment was already under assault hundreds of years ago, actually. For African-American, enslavement of Africans to work lands to produce wealth that undergirded the industrial growth of America, discriminatory lending practices, as I referred to, realigning, spatial isolation, job discrimination, political disenfranchisement, and the disproportionate siting of polluting facilities in or near these communities with also devastating environmental and health consequences. So we can see how it begins to play itself out and how race and racism is a factor that undergirds and is part of our understanding of how environmental racism works and why the environmental justice movement was formed. These are some of the, the issues that created or were the impetus for the development of a movement called the environmental justice movement. This movement was influenced by many different movements like the civil rights movement, the labor movement, the toxics movement, um, the indigenous peoples movement, traditional environmental movement, and also academics doing reports and studies. So all these influences impact, impacted what we call environmental justice today. One of the things that came out of one of the early conferences in the environmental justice movement was something called the 17 Principles of Environmental Justice. The 17 Principles of Environmental Justice. They held these two conferences in Washington, D.C. And basically, people came from various parts of the world. And the first one, comparing notes, describing and discussing the challenges that they face. And they put together what they call the 17 Principles of Environmental Justice. This is kind of like the preamble. I'll read this and I'll go through a few of the principles. There's 17 of them. I won't go through all of them. But you can Google that. It's the 17 Principles of Environmental Justice. It says, we, the people of color, gather together at these at this multinational people of color environmental leadership summit to begin to build a national and international movement of all peoples of color to fight the destruction and taking of our lands and communities to hereby reestablish our spiritual interdependence to the sacredness of our mother earth to respect and celebrate each of our cultures languages and beliefs around the natural world and our roles in healing ourselves to ensure environmental justice to promote economic alternatives which would contribute to the development of environmentally safe livelihoods and to secure our political, economic, and cultural liberation that has been denied for over 500 years of colonization and oppression, resulting in the poisoning of our communities and land and the genocide of our peoples, do affirm and adopt these principles of environmental justice. So that was a statement, although it was made many years ago, still absolutely relevant today and speaks to some of the underlying causes of the environmental injustices that we see across our country. A few of the principles, and this was in 1991 when these were developed in a conference in Washington, DC. And you can see the influence of all these groups um, for the indigenous people, affirming the sacredness of Mother Earth, the ecology and the ecological unity and the interdependence of our species, um, the demand that public policy be based on mutual respect and justice for all peoples, uh, calls for universal protection from nuclear testing, extraction, production, and disposal of toxic hazardous waste and poisons. Uh, it affirms the fundamental right to political, economic, cultural, and environmental self-determination of all peoples, demands the cessation of the production of all toxins, hazardous waste, and radioactive materials and that all past and current producers be held strictly accountable to the people for detoxification and the containment at the point of production and opposes the destructive operations of multinational corporations. So this is a very politically focused, you know, not kind of you know, waffling, but very clear statement in 1991 from people who came from all over the world, indigenous people, et cetera, to talk about this movement and form this movement. I won't go through all of this, this is just a couple of points in history. And I just talked about the principles of environmental justice in 1991. One thing I will point out that you can also Google is in 1987, there was a report done called Toxic Waste and Race, Toxic Waste and Race, which you can Google. And then another one was produced called Toxic Waste and Race 1987 to 2007. These are very important reports because they actually established, as did the US General Accounting Office report before that, 
that race was one of the primary factors in how toxic facilities were cited and where they were cited. And the correlation between race and the siting of toxic or polluting facilities was absolutely very clear. And it was uh, at a level that it was not an anomaly at all. And they found this as they did their research in various locations across the country. I just wanna show these couple more slides. So essentially here, this is a listing of brownfield and Superfund sites. Brownfield and Superfund sites. And these are sites that are, you know, highly contaminated sites. Um, they have these squares here. These are treatment storage and disposal facilities. And you can see all these brownfield sites and Superfund sites that need to be cleaned up, right? By the, by the government. So they identify these, they track them because they have to be cleaned. So all these locations here, this is South Bridge. We have other communities that surround it and with some similar profiles, you know, largely either, in this case, African-American um, or low income or a combination of that. But I wanted to point out an area like Greenville and you all probably know Greenville and the economic and racial Dynamics there are very different. And you can also see the lack of these facilities there and this concentration of these facilities here, which is kind of a visual demonstration of what happens with policy that is directed by, again, the spatial segregation of communities and then the consistent development of facilities that pollute in and around those communities. And the consequences of that are things like this cancer risk. So, high levels of exposure to toxins and chemicals in the air from various, from various facilities. And it's not just an historical occurrence, this continues to go on. Um, I've been involved with groups here who are fighting the siting of new facilities or new company, companies coming in that are gonna also add to the pollution and, and it's gonna have a cumulative impact. You can see again, the concentration here of those communities which are gonna have high levels of, of cancer and high levels of exposure. So the racial dynamics are pretty, pretty transparent, actually. And this doesn't happen by accident because all of these have to be approved permits by DINREC in the state of Delaware. Those are approval processes and companies are granted these approvals. And there's a whole step process that they have to go through before they're permitted and it's supposed to be safe for the public, et cetera, et cetera. But it continues to happen over and over again in these communities disproportionately. So I want to do a little bit of a switch to what's the current context? Because part of the thing I mentioned earlier that we'd also talk about is what are some of the barriers to addressing these issues, which are rooted in race and also the economic system, how it functions itself. Well, I wanted to read this very quickly and then um, just a few more slides now, but this is from Martin Luther King. I thought it might be apropos to maybe bring in this voice to this discussion. Um, because he's talking about segregation, but he's also talking about resistance to change and how that's related to race. And I think these dynamics play themselves out in the environmental justice movement. For these communities to have these facilities placed there over and over again for decades and decades, these are decisions that are made. So there's a point at which there is a turning away from what we see and know is going on in our society and if it doesn't impact us, we can kind of put it out of our mind. This is this asks for us to do some deep reflection as a, as a nation, if you will. But Martin Luther King in 1967, where do we go from here? He says, with each modest advance, the white population promptly raises the argument that the Negro has come far enough. Each step forward accents an ever-present tendency to backlash. This characteristic is necessarily general. It will be grossly unfair to omit recognition of a minority of whites who genuinely want authentic equality. Their commitment is real, sincere, and is expressed in a thousand deeds, but they are balanced at the other end of the pole by the unregenerated segregationists who have declared that democracy is not worth having if it involves equality. The segregationist goal is the total reversal of all reforms with the reestablishment of naked oppression and if need be a native form of fascism. America had a master race in the antebellum South, 
reestablishing it with a resurgent plan and a totally disenfranchised lower class would realize the dream of too many extremists on the right. The great majority of Americans are suspended between these opposing attitudes. They are uneasy with injustice, but unwilling yet to pay a significant price to eradicate it. The persistence of racism in depth and the dawning awareness that Negro demands will necessitate structural changes in society have generated a new phase of white resistance in North and South. Now, this is 1967, but um, I think you could just put in 2021, you might say, wow, prescient, because he's saying it could lead to development of a native form of fashion and the same dynamics of pushing, but not pushing far enough, too far now, let's pull back. This plays itself out in the environmental justice context as well, all right? So some of the barriers, and we can begin to get into a little discussion here. Um, well, just reading that quote there, the logic and structure and ideology of our economic system. If, if profit is the most important thing above everything else, that is a problem because then the environment is secondary, human life is secondary. And the clarity when we add race into that, then someone's going to be sacrificed in order for profits to be made. And if the people who are sacrificed have already had a history of being viewed as expendable, then their communities are expendable. And we can continue to make profit because they are paying that cost, not us. But obviously we've reached a point in the world now where these problems are playing themselves out across the whole globe. And we can talk about that. Corporate influence and interest. The fossil fuel interests of the world, chemical interests, pharmaceutical interests, et cetera, big agri, et cetera, all of these lead to various levels of pollution, and destruction of the environment and health of people. But again, the profit and the influence on the political structure of the nation is a major challenge and a barrier. Racism, as has been pointed out, is obviously a problem. Being able to get people to see that all people deserve equal protection is part of the congenital challenge that we face in America to move past this impasse around the issue of race and to strive, strive towards true equality for all people. And then there's the issue of materialism and consumerism. So we're always, we're being trained every day to buy this and buy that, but it is our enormous appetite in the United States um, and other countries like the United States, Western, Western countries in particular, others that consume so much with little regard to what the impacts of our consumption patterns are on the world. And almost everything we have comes from somewhere. Either it's produced by somebody, it's extracted, it's turned into some um, good at the end of the day that we purchase. How much do we need? Because when they dig in the ground in another country and their water is polluted, we get the product and we can get it cheap because of labor. Laborers are paid next to nothing. We get our fruit cheap. We can get it any time of the year, all out of season. We're growing stuff in other people's countries. Their land is being taken over by big businesses. So we can get cheap vegetables and fruits that maybe they can't even afford to eat and get very little pay to do the work. So this connectedness and the constant pushing by advertisement to buy more, to buy more, to buy more, to buy more, it just feeds this monster. So we have to get off that train. So the companies obviously are directing, guiding this. We are participants, and so we have some influence in this in terms of even our own patterns. And then there's the issue of misinformation and not getting real information about how all these things fit together. And that is coming back on us now. When we look at climate change, this is one of the consequences that nature itself is saying no in, in all kinds of different ways. And we're paying the, the cost for this across the globe. So we're at a point of crisis. Taking action, we can take action in our local communities. We can take action at our counties. Do they have policies? We can do this right now. Who's your elected official? Do you have any policies around environmental justice? Do you have any policies around protecting the environment? Where do we get the fuel from for a city? Are we powered by you know, fossil fuels? Do we have a plan to get off of fossil fuels for a city or county or state, et cetera? We can support local, state, and national efforts. Um, Faith-based initiatives to do that. Both, both in terms of bringing churches together to leverage both the membership of churches who have people who are in all aspects of society to begin to push this, to push this in terms of dealing with our elected officials in our communities and working with 
organizations that are doing the direct organizing on these issues. So that's the end of the presentation. You know, I just wanted to, if there's some questions on this, I can come out of the uh, the share screen and we can have some discussions. But that's the, the presentation about environmental justice, some of the barriers, social, economic, societal barriers uh, to the full realization of environmental justice, a healthy planet and healthy people. So thank you very much. And is there any questions? Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, why don't you go ahead and take down your uh, slides now so we can all uh, come back. I, you know, I, I am amazed every time I look at those 17 principles and the inconsistency between them and the focus on growth in a society like this. And, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the ways in which a place like the USA can begin to make this transition, that, that turn from the presumption that because we are a capitalist society, we always have to be focused on economic growth. Are there, are there ways in which there could be some, some way of synchronizing some of these principles um, in an affluent society where there is so much wealth, um, presumably some of which could be devoted to different kinds of purposes? Wow, that's a great question. Wow. So I think there's something called the just transition, just transition. So there's been a lot of work on this in discussions about, again, moving to renewable energy. That's one way to do that. Um, conservation and particularly like energy efficiency. That's something we can do to reduce our carbon footprints in our households to use less with energy efficient appliances, lighting, et cetera, insulation of homes, that's gonna reduce the use of fossil fuels in terms of heating and cooling if it's gonna be in the summertime using air conditioning. So those are things we can do at the local level. Um, I think there is this kind of dynamic that if you do things that are good for the environment, then you're going to stop the country and everything's gonna fall apart. And that's an argument that's used over and over again. The reality is, is that for instance, in the solar industry, solar now has dropped to be lower than the cost of fossil fuels and, and definitely coal and other areas of the world, so as well as here. So the cost of solar has gone down exponentially. So it's now competitive and in some instances now it's even cheaper than the fossil fuels. So that argument has just been absolutely just blown out of the water. It just makes no sense anymore to do this other than having companies trying to squeeze out the last amount of dollars that they can get out of extracting the last amount of oil that we don't need anymore, actually. And then we have battery storage systems still coming on. And these are very important ways that we can move away from the fossil fuels, but also different technologies, cleaner industries that can be developed. These will be the industries of the future. I know there's wind turbines, again, solar, um, the practice and training of people for energy efficiency which can be used to retrofit buildings all across the country, which will create millions of jobs, all these industries combined. So we have a way to move away from that and still create jobs that can help to keep people employed but by also reducing our, our carbon footprint. Also our way that we grow our food, the way that we consume our food. Do we need to have everything all year round? If it means that in order for us to do that, we have to get something planted in another country where big businesses essentially go ahead and take over their land, maybe taking away the livelihood of many farmers there who now have no way to live. And if you go to India and other places, you have high levels of suicide in countries because the farmers are being, their land is being taken away. They're no longer able to farm. So other countries are quote unquote, the developed countries can have cheap food all year round or have tulips that we call it. I mean, this, this is the way that we're living our lives. We could change that and that would make a huge difference. I'm a vegan myself. I don't recommend that everybody be a vegan, but I do think that at least eating less meat is a good thing. It's reducing meat intake because the 
cattle and the growing of cattle uses up a lot of land, a lot of water, and then there's methane and everything else, and there's pollutants, even agribusinesses, the way that we take over like deserts. I was reading an article about Arizona where, so we have lettuce grown in Arizona and they've taken over massive amounts of land. They've been growing this for years, sucking the water out to, and about 70% of the water goes toward you know, the industry growing lettuce. Well, that's a problem because you have Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, California, all depending upon water sources, which are being overtaxed by farming to give us the convenience of having these vegetables. So when you turn a desert into farmland, then you need a lot of water. It's just, it's not natural even, really, but we've been able to do it, but the cost is now being paid. So those are the things that we can begin to do. So it's changing some of our personal, but a lot of it's at the corporate level and at the governmental level. All right, so let's open this up to questions, comments from others uh, on the call. Jeffrey, Roger Reinecker. Hello, how are you? Um, one thing we haven't talked about is um, the corporations adopting a new model. I mean, the quarter to quarter quarterly profits, uh, the only obligation a corporation has is to its uh, stakeholders and shareholders. Um, I have seen the beginnings of no, that's not quite right. Uh, the corporation has responsibilities to the community. It has responsibilities to uh, its workers. It has responsibilities to the neighborhoods. Um, is this trend going to be nipped in the bud by just the price of, you know, the price of stock and the the need to get returns, or is this something that we can try and, uh, you know, nurture? Of that attitude is that corporate responsibility is more than just quarterly profits. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I think two things. Um, so some of the major companies, oil companies, and the thing that's really important, I guess for people to know that these companies knew this years ago, that this was gonna happen. Like Exxon, they have, I mean, it's an oil company. They have all kinds of scientists and researchers. They do research and projections. They knew what was going to happen. They predicted what was going to happen if they continued to do this. But they told the public that there was no connection. They did this for many years. And one of the things that's very similar to this is with the big tobacco companies. I used to work with an organization that they led this kind of whole campaign against big tobacco. For years, the tobacco companies knew that there was a direct correlation between smoking and cancer. But they denied it for years because they're making money. We have over like 400,000 people a year die in this country because of cigarette related causes, over 400,000. I mean, so it was profit. And then when they got restrictions put on here, they just went to developing nations and other places to sell the cigarettes and do the same thing again. So I do think that putting pressure on companies at the corporate and board level is very important. Some of that is being done. There are shareholders who are raising issues. Some groups, there were a couple of major environmental groups that raised enough money to get seats at boards and start raising these issues to begin to influence them directly at their board meetings. And also one of the things that's beginning to happen is some of the companies are seeing that they'll have stranded assets if they continue to invest in fossil fuels, given where the world is going. There's so much pressure now beginning to come to the fore that there needs to be a higher levels of responsibility. So they're gonna be stuck with this asset and what's happening technologically, people, the move to renewable energy resources is happening dramatically. Many of the major car manufacturers um, up until maybe like 20 years or so in this range, they're not going to make combustion engine vehicles anymore. I and mean, these are some of the major car manufacturers. They're making these kind of plants. And you already see more electric vehicles on the road even now. So you got this asset, which everybody needs, fossil fuels. The transition is occurring right now in real time. And so it, it's even madness that they would continue to hold on to this. But I think these companies can be influenced. They can be influenced by consumers. They can be influenced by people at the board level. Um, I participated in the Free South Africa movement. That was a big part of it. Boycotts also influencing boards. So I think that can make a difference. And I have a friend who's um, on a board of a company called Ben & Jerry's. Somebody you probably heard that company before. She actually used to be the board, the board chair. 
So um, they have, as in terms of companies, you know, they were taken over by Unilever, but they've locked into place one of the more progressive corporate structures probably in the country, I would say, for a company. And they ensure Ben and Jerry that when it was taken over, that they would follow these dictates and guidelines that they had set up for the company in terms of their contributions, in terms of their concerns about the environment, et cetera. So that Ben and Jerry's document is probably at least one that could be looked at as a model to push companies to do the right thing. And then other part of it is putting pressure on them and by not buying their products. I mean, they, they understand money. And that's something that consumers have to begin to do more, but also there's some policy issues and then getting seats on the board. And then there's gonna be a whole range of other issues like the environmental justice movement, like the civil rights movement, civil disobedience, all those things are part of this. We've reached a point of crisis. And I know when I was growing up, people were talking about, you know, it's a crisis and it was a crisis, but now it's, it's at a point of, it's extremely dangerous where we are right now. And all of you, you all know that you've been around a long time Gee whiz, you see what's happening in our country. You see the weather patterns. You see all the fires. I used to live out in Los Angeles. The fires that are happening on the West Coast, the flooding. What happened here in Wilmington when Ida came through? I went down to the Brandywine. I, I, you know, I've only been here since 2013. I've never seen anything like that. It was like, and I asked people who've been here for years, they said, I've never seen anything like that. I mean, this river was so high and it was going so fast. I thought it was like a, in the Colorado River or something. It was uh, it was it was amazing and frightening at the same time. So, um, yeah, I think there's there's things that we can do. Definitely at at the local level, there's things we can do at the corporate level, and um, and those are things that we have to do. We, we don't we don't have many options right now. Just and not doing anything is not an option. Complacency is not an option. Not getting involved is not an option. We we cannot do that. That is the probably the worst thing that we can do is to not engage. Other questions? Or please? I have to say, I have thought of um, buying an electric car to replace uh, the gas powered one that I have. Um, thought about solar panels on the roof, um, community restrictions be damned. Um, I have to confess, I never thought about all those tulips I buy. <laughs> I love- I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I oh, did, no. <laughs> Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. Maybe, maybe the one you I thought loved, of growing, I love growing in, tulips, in the United especially States. In the, no, especially in the winter. And I'm done with, I'm done with tulips. You will never, oh, no. see, you will never <laughs> see tulips. Yeah, maybe silk uh, ones. Right. Maybe silk Well, I'm kind of joking. But anyway, th but these are real questions. I mean, and it's not like, you know, because we all are connected to this and nobody can be 100% off of it. But I think even asking questions more and more like, you know, I love avocados. But I'm thinking like, wow, a lot of these are growing in Mexico. And I know the people that grow them, they can't even afford to eat these things, right? And so how much of this do we need? Do we need to have it all year round? Do we need to have everything like this? We're breaking patterns of nature in ways that we have the technology to do, but it doesn't solve the problem. And it creates a lot of problems. Like growing the lettuce in the desert in Arizona, yes, we can get the water to go there, but look how much water you're using. And now you're at a point where the water levels are so low, there's a real threat that it's something that most people can't even get their head around in the United States because we know that there are people who are refugees in other parts of the world because of changing weather patterns. Sure. Crops aren't growing in the way they used to, so people are leaving. They're going to other places. Now you're having tensions between groups. This is a really um, apocalyptic kind of thing that's going on right now. And in our own country, we're going to begin to see this happen more and more, particularly in the Western states, probably first, as these water levels get down. And, and then you have the farmers saying they want to keep producing the way they are. Well, that can't happen. It's an unsustainable model. The water levels are down. You have whole communities, whole states that will lose major access to major water supplies for millions of people. And that's what we're teetering right now. This is, this is a real, real situation that we're in. So we have to change these patterns. And hopefully we won't wait till the last minute, which is seems to be where we're headed with this, um, to make these changes. And well, I'm, I'm really- Oh, sorry. 
know, I'm inspired, I'm inspired by a lot of young people around the world and here who are pushing right now over at that conference. And also there's some things happening in the state of Delaware that are also very, um, I think, speak to what can be done by people coming together. And there's a community solar legislation that was signed by the governor. I'm on that task force with a lot of other people. Senator Stephanie Hansen is heading that. There's a lot of people involved in different groups, environmental groups, et cetera, to push that. There is a renewable portfolio standard that was expanded. It needs to be more, but at least it was increased some. Uh, there's some folks working on cumulative impact so that when companies want to site their facility somewhere, they have to take into consideration the high level of pollutants that are there already before they add another um, company there. So those things are happening in the state. Positive, where people are taking action and taking control and saying, we want to move things forward. I'm sorry. Just to, just to conclude, what I think is important is kind of the awareness, you know, just the being aware. Uh, because it isn't, as you say, just that we have things that are out of season. It's what, you know, were fossil fuels used to transport the goods from where they started to here? I mean, it's a, it's a whole supply chain issue with a lot of ramifications. And just that level of awareness, I think. Um, individual actions aren't life altering, but it leads to a recognition and an openness to group or, you know, group or community action that I think is really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think I saw Sally and then Lynn. Thanks, Casey. Actually, not me, but um, I just following up on on what Sue just said um, and and one of Catherine Hayhoe's points is that each each little change we make like that, like like not buying strawberries in February that are coming from California, let alone something from from out of the country, um, changes us. So we're more aware of the next the next change we can make. And and all of these pieces are important. I think that's true. We can support local farmers. I mean, I'm at the university and I'm thinking like because I know there's a big company called Aramark and they do like a lot of the, you know, um, football games, baseball games, universities, campuses, schools, pre-packaged everything and they send it there. But how about we connect with our local farmers and I would support them. And then maybe we work with them, those that don't use fertilizers, we try to get them to use fewer fertilizers and do food that is more organic. We can do that. And certainly local farmers would be like, great, support us. But those are things we can do to reduce some of that, yeah. And it wouldn't maybe wouldn't need to be wrapped all in plastic. Oh my goodness, the plastic issue, boy. There's a they're talking about building a massive plant in Pennsylvania because they're losing profits as they snip. Right now, it's going up because of this you know transport issue that they're dealing with. But the profits ultimately they see it's going to spiral down as renewable energy moves, et cetera, et cetera. So making plastic, they have a big plant to make more plastic, and they figure they can which use fossil fuels. So they're looking at ways of investing in more plastics as a way to extend the life of fossil fuels. So this is the, this is the thinking that's going on. It's, it's, it's you know, it's kind of crazy. That's another, another little piece we can put into our, our action is eliminating as much fossil fuel. I mean, as much plastic use as we can. Yeah, absolutely. Len? Thank you. So I wanted to go back to corporations um, because, again, they play such a huge role in all of um, all of this. And you know, you talk some about um, trying to have more influence by getting seats on boards and having direct insider influence and stuff. What do you see as the possibilities for the role of you know the SRIs or the socially responsible investing? Um, a lot more of those funds are propping up and stuff. Do you see an opportunity for you know investors and the financial markets to play more of a role in directing more responsible behavior? Uh, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> so this is a tricky one because I'm working with a group now. They install and we've partnered the largest community solar project on public housing in the country. So. We're, we're, we're partnering, we're looking at hopefully doing some things in the state. And, and also it's not just the solar, but it, it comes with reducing costs, but also providing scholarships for residents and also providing jobs. So we're linking all these things together to leverage solar installation 
for economic development purposes, so a, a different approach. And we all are both social mission driven companies. Because in most cases, people don't do that because it's not, we just want to get the solar and roll out, which I'm not going to tag, at least it's helping reduce fossil fuels. We're, we want to go like multiple levels deeper. So I think these socially responsible investment funds are really important to help to spur and develop new technologies. And students in the classroom, when I talk with them, if they're in science and engineering, and we know that, again, there's a military connection here because a lot of the money for research, a lot of it comes from the government, a lot of it's military related. So do I want my child spending most of their mind, their time rather, developing um, technologies for like biological weapons? They might get a good job at the school, but that's what they're doing. Is that what you want them to do? And I ask students, is that what you do? They think about this now. I mean, if I needs a job, at least think about what we're, what, what we're doing with, with our minds and our talents. So how about creating more opportunities for them to invest in? Well, how do we build in clothing that when you have water repellent clothing, and there's a company here that you may know of called DuPont, they developed something called Teflon, and then another one, Gore-Tex. These are big companies in the state of Delaware. Yeah. They influence the culture of the state. They develop products. Can we do products that have some of those properties but don't have those consequences? And I think those are the kind of investments that will make a difference that we begin, how do we build our building? What are the materials that we use? So that we don't use materials that will drain and take so much energy even to produce. If we put our minds to that, I think we can get those things done. I know there's usually this thing of, you know, so many things came out of the space program, but during the space program, we solved this program or this problem, we solved that problem. I, for me, and I'm probably just too simple with this stuff, but I'm thinking, why don't we just, ask people to solve the problems that we know we have and put their minds on that as opposed to having it be a byproduct of going to the moon or something. I mean, I'm just I'm too elementary. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm just asking. But anyway, I think we could do that with our minds. If we can say we're going to go to the moon under Kennedy and, and we put all these resources to do that, we could say we want to end poverty. And this is what Martin Luther King was talking about. Let's put the resources to do that. Let's put the resources in our thinking, our monies, to develop the technologies that will be clean technologies. We can do that. The same thinking, the same mind, the same resource. So, so, um, was... it, uh, one follow up on, on that point. I've been encouraged at least to hear the reports from the from the um, from COP26 of financial institutions who are turning away from um, financing fossil fuel projects. I think that's a critical piece because we know that since we're talking about corporations and they are, we all can do individual efforts and that's critically important. I think our local efforts, talking to local elected officials, city, county, state is really important because we can have much more influence as we've seen. I mentioned a couple of things and pieces of legislation that are now moving forward in the state. This is not theoretical, this is happening by people coming together. But I think these issues of the investment and pushing investment into the new sectors is really, really key to influence these companies and to raise these issues in, with our investments. I know, speaking of, we got a church here, we Presbyterian churches. I mean, I'm at a university, there's universities across the country. Where are the investments? This is something that was raised in the, during the apartheid years, the same way now with investments. How many of the investments are in clean, renewable, leaning, or investing in um, businesses or other? enterprises that are about saving the planet, about creating jobs for the future, clean technology, things like that, right? Energy efficiency. So those are things that are growing. Um, and we had the opportunity in this country actually to be, you know, far out ahead of this because solar was developed in this country. It was used in the space program years ago, like the 50s. So, but China is now the leading producer of of solar photovoltaics in, in the world, right? So, and that means that most of the world, they're going to them to buy things. This is not an anti-Chinese thing. I'm not saying, I'm suggesting, I'm just saying that you have technology and you choose to invest in things that don't lead. It was smart on China's part to do that because they saw where the world was going. We have to begin to utilize a forward thinking view of the world. And, and there's one thing that comes out of this, and it goes back to these principles of environmental justice. One of the indigenous groups, there is something called the seventh generation, this kind of concept of the seventh generation 
some of you may know this, but it's basically what we do now that we think about the consequences of our actions unto the seventh generation. Mm -hmm. Now imagine what this country would be like if we thought about the consequences of our actions, the consequences of our investments, the consequences of our business decisions, the consequences of the production of goods and services into the seventh generation. That means we would ask not whether this effectively solves this problem as the only question, but does it effectively solve this problem and does it reduce or does it not even at all pollute or create problems for the environment and health of people? We ask those questions separately. Plastic keeps water off of your product, but it also uses fossil fuels, and many of them have chemicals in them that are bad for us, like PFAs and other things like that, phthalates, right, that impact our systems in very significant ways. And plastic is pervasive. Why? It makes money for people that produce plastic. It's convenient, but we got to do things. We didn't always have plastic. I know that, and some of you probably maybe have a year or two of me, I don't know, but you know, it's a very young crowd here, I can see. But you know, we always didn't have plastic at, at the same level that we do now. We had a world without that. We found a way to do that. We can find other ways and substitutions for this as well. This is a convenience. It's cheap, they say, but it's not cheap because it has environmental consequences. And for people that live next to those facilities where it's being produced, the consequences are hugely significant, dire on the, for their health, the water and the environment. And at this point, none of us can escape from the consequences of what has been put into motion by this just addiction to fossil fuels and greed. And then we export it all around the world. Unfortunately. Uh, I, 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 I remember um, I know that I'm probably the youngest person here, but I remember when I started going to Africa at a very young age, there was virtually no plastic. Um, and watching that over a 50 year period, all of a sudden you go to Africa now and there are these black plastic bags everywhere. Uh, so there is this exportation of these environmental injustices um, to the rest of the world. And there is a racial class dimension to that um, as well. Well, we're coming close to our time, but I saw that there were a couple other questions. Uh, Roger? I had a comment. Um... Some of the solutions, I think, one, I think, has been proposed for the plastics industry, uh, which is that they really own their product all the way to the grave or the recycling, is to make them pay for every piece of plastic uh, and uh, really subsidize the retrieval and recycling of that plastic. And that's a proposal. That's a real proposal that could be put forth and has been put forth. It's, you know, of course, they'll fight it tooth and nail, but when you think about um, the ocean pollution and the third world countries that simply don't have any mechanisms for recycling, no one is going to re put a recycling plant next to the place where all the, you know, all the bottles are showing up in the, in the ocean. But if you make those companies responsible for that um, by legislation, then you'll, you'll see something happen. In the same way, I think we probably um, really need to talk about the carbon tax and dividend, and we should call it the carbon dividend rather than the carbon tax, because you know, if you saw something a tax, you immediately alienate 70% of the populace. But if we call it the carbon dividend, um, I think that would go a, a ways towards saying, look, let's put a real cost on you know, shipping those tulips to, to Saludamon, you know, to <laughs> shipping the strawberries uh, to us. And, and, and it's not inconsequential ocean traffic uh, to bring all those products from Amazon that we love from China. Uh, the, the carbon footprint of the shipping industry is monstrous, not, let alone the, uh, the damage done by the ships and the bilge water and dragging the anchor across an oil pipeline has done. So our consumerism is so much at fault. Um, 
and we're all guilty of it. I mean, just, just look at what we do. But I think a carbon dividend is something that we um, really need to get up, get behind. And I'd be interested in your comment about the uh, pressure that was put on South Africa by divesting of uh, investments in South Africa. Was that in the end effective? I think it was effective. I mean, it's a combination. There was a protest all over the world. Um, I mean, I was in, I got arrested. I was in some of those protests, you know, the crew ran because it connected multiple things. It was obviously the apartheid state, racist, fascist state, clear. Black people working in mines, dangerous conditions, massacres of people. These are things that began to put pressure on them, but then all the blockades of money, getting people to divest, that does begin to put pressure on them. And that does begin to start turning things around. It's very important because it gets again to the money. Hitting the money, addressing the money issue is really critically important for these big companies. And some of them, their brand consciousness, their sensitive to impacts on the brand, but it has to be sustained and getting, you know, and, and not um, kind of ameliorated with some type of like words or some little puffy program that doesn't really do anything, but really pushing them to do strong programs. So those kind of concerted efforts, and particularly when they're global in nature, those can have pressure and put pressure on these companies. And I think Casey, your point about what's happening in Africa, this is this globalization. We didn't talk about that. I was focusing more here, the US, but this is a whole nother discussion about what we do with our goods. Like the fashion industry, for instance, now we have clothing, we make new, brands every year and then all of our old clothing I, speaking of africa like in ghana this is one example our old clothing from the u.s is shipped over there and there's so much of it that it's becoming a problem so people take that they buy it they sell resell it but then there's so much of it that they, they have to bury it we're sending ships of used clothing over there i mean and then our garbage like in chester pennsylvania they're getting garbage but then we also were shipping garbage to other countries, plastics and everything. China eventually just said, stop, we're not doing that. And some other countries said, we're not taking your garbage anymore. So the idea of like, we can just develop millions and millions of tons of garbage and then we just send it to somebody else. It's yeah. again, you talk about outsourcing your responsibility. So it's that, that mindset like as in, let's go to Mars, <laughs> which is not a solution. It's like, let's just go over there and then we'll trash Mars. So stopping that mindset and, and getting people to pull back and say, whoa, this is not a sustainable way to live. The planet is giving us all types of cues and, and messages that we have, we have to hear. Because um, again, we're at the point now where um, there's really no bargaining room here. We have to really press the issue with all of the various strategies. But part of it is gonna be, we have to change how we are living. That's part of it. But, Making corporations accountable and responsible is important. And also pushing back this idea that if you do that, the economy is going to fall apart. Because it won't fall apart. And other countries are moving and their economies are growing and getting stronger. So we're obviously that's not the case. And if people are beginning to make electric vehicles and other things like that for a new economy and making a transition, we're going to find ourselves as this big country that is going to be quite a bit behind the curve. And if you want to talk about something that's going to impact your economy, now that's really going to impact your economy. And that's something we should be talking more about as well. Yeah. I, I, I would say the divestiture movement in South Africa is a, is a marvelous example, actually. Um, it was what absolutely finally broke the system, this global movement uh, that removed all of the funding for weaponry for example, they weren't able to, to purchase the weapon to continue to prosecute the war. Um, and it was a worldwide movement. And, and think what the consequences would be if there were uh, an anti-carbon movement, uh, for example, of that scope. Uh, it's, it's a lesson in what uh, we can do as organized um, uh, citizens, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Sue, do you have any closing comments? I think we've just about uh, come to the end of our time. This has been a wonderful discussion. 
Um, it has indeed. Thank you for inviting Professor Richardson. Thank you for being here. Uh, it was a, a great lesson and discussion. Thank you to all of you who participate. Um, we're grateful that you're here. Uh, I think we can all resolve to take a few steps um, to change behavior, uh, to make some inroads. And typically, beginning a process of change like that builds some impetus to continue. Uh, and so it's my hope that, uh, that that's what happens with all of us. And of course, as a church, our Earth Care Task Force has been focused on this for years, more than, more than a decade, right, Sally and Roger? Yep. And That's so uh, we will strive to keep up the good work and see what other inroads we might make in the community and the legislature uh, and in corporate America. So thank you once again. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so thank much, you everybody. So much. Appreciate it, Casey, all of you. Thanks so much, Sue. Thank you, Jeffrey. Forward and onward, together, together, together. We can. Right. <laughs> good night, all. Thank you. All right, Thank good night. You. Bye. Uh, and Sue, if you've got a minute, if you can hang on uh, for us to talk about another matter. Okay. <clears throat> well, we can start, Casey. It's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I, I just wanted to follow up on uh, the note you sent from Charlie mm -hmm. um, about the, the tutoring uh, program. It seems like a wonderful idea. And um, at least a part of what we have been trying to get organized um, to do um, and what, uh, what um, Susan has asked me to help with is to try to find things just like that, mm -hmm. that could engage us more. Right. And um, she and I have been having trouble connecting because my schedule has been messy because I'm trying to close out my university life and she's working and- <laughs> I know, we'll just get so, to um, sorts of things. Um, there may be, um, more to discuss about this after I get together with her. Okay. Uh, we are trying to get together before our meeting Monday um, evening, uh, but but yes, it's it's a wonderful idea, um, and um, I think in fairly short order we'll be able to send some communication about um, how to develop some in interface for getting that done. Okay. Um, Maybe we'll uh, okay. On the backpacks, you know, I, I have not, still not been a, gotten anything back from uh, Sierra. Yeah, nor have I. So we're gonna, we're gonna um, go for a little bit, but we'll we will follow up with that. Yeah, I don't know yeah and, and maybe, um, you know, I hated to call Melody about it because I know how busy she is, but right. anyway, when we next get together to talk about that, then we'll, we'll, we'll see if there's something else we ought to do. And there may well be um, a way in which we can get information about that if we get this effort going mm -hmm. um, to get the church more engaged um, with the work group and, and, and the warehouse as, as, as volunteers and providing other kinds of support. And, and if we decide that we want to follow up on Charlie's suggestion, we could begin putting some things in the weekly word and yeah. then um, if we can come to some sort of conclusion about how to proceed, uh, I think the deadline for the, well, the deadline for the January chimes is the first week in December. So that gives okay. us- a kind of Oh yeah, we, 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 we probably together. should have enough together yeah. to, to get something in there about that. I gonna start mentoring in December, you know? Yeah. I, just, I don't think, so I think if we can focus on that January, <laughs> Yeah. publication yeah. And, and how people could sign up. Uh, we could potentially enlist some people who've done it yeah. with Eastside yeah. Charter or Urban Promise to give little testimonials about. Yeah. Uh, I know Liz Bacon of Westminster has actually been 
a mentor at Eastside Charter, and I have now sent her two oh. emails asking if she would write a little blurb about it or if she might be interested. And I, I haven't heard from her. I don't know if she's traveling or whatever. Um, okay. uh, but I think there are people who've done it, who've been very um, impacted by the relationships that they've had yeah. with, with children. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think there's there's no doubt when I've done this um, uh, before, it's it's just been um, amazing what happened to me as a product of doing. Exactly. It. It's not just the child, yeah. yeah, and the fact that they're that they are willing to entertain virtual relationships. Yeah. I think well, yes, it will yeah. Really, yeah, you know, yeah. enable some yeah. people who. Who aren't able to get out and travel, yeah. Um, yeah. or when we have weather circumstances in, in, in the winter, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Wonderful. Well, well um, I, I, you know, the the other thing I didn't didn't get, I wanted to get back to Jeffrey on was those graphics he showed of Wilmington, which mm. is, is just another whole story that mm -hmm. um, I wanted him to talk a little bit. I heard him do a presentation. Um, somewhere that was entirely about local circumstances. Um, and that, you know, that really, those graphics tell the incredible story about how if you go to every state um, in this country, you could document that kind of, you could find that kind of story. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that I learned was that because the prevailing wind direction in the United States or North America is west to east, uh, typically uh, cities sprang up along rivers um, mm -hmm. because of transport and a whole range of other things. Um, and so invariably, uh, the industrial production was put on the east side of the river and the housing was put on the west side particularly for those affluent enough to buy yeah. on the west side. And what it's resulted in is traffic is always going the same direction, morning and afternoon. Um, and then you have the environmental effects of the, um, the redlining and the segregation and the air quality. I mean, it, and you see it replicating over and over, over and over. over. And it's like, this is no coincidence, do you know? Yeah. This, yeah. This, yeah, that's the thing that you realize is that this cannot be coincidence. <laughs> Somebody had a plan. <laughs> a really good plan, and they were really good at executing too. Some people yeah. plan and can't do, but th these folks did both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All well, right, so maybe thanks so much. Say, I don't know if I'm going to be there. Some, I I am going to be at the concert Sunday. I don't know if I'm going to church or not, but anyway. Well, I will be at church, so maybe I'll see you then. And okay. I'm not sure about the concert, so anyway. All right, Thanks so again. All right. see you later. Yep, bye-bye.